This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Hi, it's Herd Tell Show. It is Monday, August the 15th. Year of our Lord 2022 just continues to roll right along. Summer's over. If you got kids, I know on the calendar it says longer, but schools are getting back in session. We got football this Friday night. Can't wait for that. Hope you and yours are well wherever you are across the street around the world. Hope you had a great weekend. Boy, is it going to be a busy week of turning down the noise of the news cycle. Let's get right into it. We got a couple different stories we want to talk about. Uh, There's trouble down south in Mexico with the Army. AMLO is looking to change how the National Guard is ran. We're going to cover that. Also, there was a CBS morning show item about kids are obese and not going outside because of climate change and temperature. We're going to deal with that, turn noise down on that, talk about some of the issues involving with that. Our good faith segment. We always try to end on an uplifting note. This is a good one. They brought over some Ukrainian kids who had been working on a play when the war broke out about missing parents of all things. And though that was supposed to be about work, it took on special meaning because parents are off to war. Those kids are in New York City now performing it in New York City. Really cool story. Also raising money. You're going to be blown away by what they want to raise money for, not just the war effort, something very specific that I don't think we've ever covered kid charities trying to raise money for before. Pretty cool stuff. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, Our guest today from the Tax Foundation, Sean Bray, going to talk about tax policy, but not just U.S. policy, overseas U.S. policy, tax policy with the EU, tax policy with the U.K., the U.K. uh, prime minister race in the Conservative Party. Taxes are one of the top level issues being discussed. Sean's going to break down why the tax rate in the U.K. is such an issue, where they rank compared to the EU and the U.S., why that's such a problem, why Americans should care about overseas tax policies, because it affects our companies, our corporations, and our trade. Also, he'll explain a little bit about how, even though we don't understand our own tax policy, we better start paying attention to how things like that affect not only us, but the rest of the Sean Bray from the Tax Foundation on Herd Tell today. Uh, first, let's go back to the fallout from the Mar-a-Lago search warrant. Uh, let's read from Axios. I've already written in Ordinary-Times.com. We'll link to it again. Everybody absolutely lost their mind about this. An amazing thing about it is on that Monday night when this first went down, everybody lost their mind without having a bit of clue what any of this was about. They were just reacting to their priors. So let's go to the GOP because the GOP is the party of Donald Trump until somebody knocks him off. Let's look at some of their reactions. Uh, and they're not uniform. There's a little bit of doubt creeping in here. People aren't sure how to react to this thing. Let's go to Axios. Um, Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee held a press conference on Friday um, before the release of some of this information. Here's what some of themselves, uh, Representative Elsie Stefanik of New York, that's the number three in the House of Representatives, called the search a, quote, complete abuse, suggesting it was because Trump is, this is a quote from her, Joe Biden's most likely political opponent in 2024. Other members relitigated past grievances against the FBI over Russiagate, over the 2017 congressional baseball shooting, and of course, Hillary Clinton's email scandals. Quote, you can say nuclear weapons, but there are things that are highly, highly classified. There are things that are not extremely classified, Mike Turner said. And of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene 
began calling for defund the FBI and Representative Paul Gosser of Arizona tweeted, quote, I will support a complete dismantling and elimination of the Democratic brown shirts known as the FBI. These freaking people, man. We'll deal with this in just a second, though. A couple others real quick. Uh, Representative Brian Fitzpatrick, Republican from Pennsylvania, he's notable because he was an FBI agent, said it's incumbent on everybody to act in a way that's becoming of the office they hold and, quote, it's not casting judgment on anything until you know all the facts. Thank you, Representative Fitzgerald. Um, Representative Chris Stewart of Utah. I mean, if he actually had special access program, talking about Trump here, special access program is top secret, uh, compartmentalized. That's a higher level. Do you know how extremely sensitive that is? If that's actually in his residence, that would be a problem. Here's one that got all the headlines over the weekend. Remember what Margie Taylor Green and Gossard, who are definitely in the MAGA wackadoo wing nut wing of the GOP said defund the FBI quote Dan Crenshaw Republican from Texas quote I'm impressed Democrats finally got us to say defund the FBI he said that makes you look unserious when you start talking like that and one last one Homeland Security Committee ranking member John Katko of New York Republican said quote this is not something you rush to judgment on it's incumbent on everybody to take a deep breath little bit of discernment here Yes, you need to take a deep breath. I think Representative Crenshaw is completely right here. You do sound crazy when you start yelling, defund the FBI just because they did something you didn't like to do. It's crazy talk. This is an investigation. By the way, I still don't, even if everything they're saying, they're not going to arrest Trump over this. Some underling is going to go down because there's six names on the official document of who's in charge of these classified documents. It'll be them, not Trump, that gets in trouble legally and in the court system if it goes to however he's absolutely right you're fine yes what he did was wrong if it turns out to be what this is but you don't lose any twitter points waiting from monday to friday to find out the full thing before you go all in on it the people that go all in on news stories as soon as they break aren't doing it out of knowledge they're doing it out of their priors and their agendas and it was never more obvious than in the last week and even in the gop People who need those Trump voters and are slow to want to offend them, even them are starting to back up off the ledge a little bit, realizing that they've gone too far this time. This is a story that's going to develop. Let it develop. Let it breathe. Doesn't cost you anything. Oh, yeah, you won't get the seal claps from your in-tribe on social media for doing it that way, but it's the right way to do. It'll keep you looking from silly because you never know what's going to come out of this investigation yet. It may not come out to anything. And in both of those cases... Wouldn't you rather have just gone slowly along with the program and found out along with everybody else instead of winding out like Wiley Coyote out over the cliff? And as soon as you look down, you realize there's nothing there and you're in for a nasty fall. More Hurtel right after this. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage. All the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try.
Uh, welcome back to Her Tale. Okay, this was all over social media over the weekend, so let's talk about it for a second. CBS Morning did a spot, and really it was their viral post and the way they framed it more than the spot they did. Um, I'm going to read the Twitter uh, headline off of this because it kind of gets to the ridiculousness of this a little bit, and then there's a video attached. We're going to link to all of it. As always, watch the whole thing, read the whole thing, make up your own mind, but here's the Twitter headline that said everybody a twittering. Um, quoting from CBS Morning Show, today's children are 30% less aerobically fit than their parents were at their age, a new study found. So far, so good. And then we take a left turn. The study points to climate change and rising temperatures adversely affecting childhood obesity as children spend less time exercising outdoors. Folks, kids are not going outside because of climate change. Yes, it's a little hot this summer. That's not what's going on here. There's other things going on here. Now, uh, the older generation immediately pointed towards technology and the fact that the younger generation are glued to their phones. Um, and They're always inside on that social media. And I, there's probably some truth to that. But remember, they said the same thing about radio, same thing about TV, same thing about video games, same thing about the Internet, same thing about social media, now about smartphones. This is a very old trope it gets moved as the new technology expands one problem with that is of course they can take their phones outside um, i've seen my kids they'll go out sit on a trampoline and be on their phone so technically they are outside jumping around doing stuff they're still on their phones so that's part of it but that's not all of it i do want to point out one thing and there's multiple reasons that this is occurring but can we point out to one really obvious one uh, we just spent two years as a country telling children that if they go outside, they're going to die. And we had the ridiculousness during COVID of municipalities and local politicians doing things like blocking off playgrounds. Remember in Venice Beach, California, they had the ridiculousness where they were filling in the skate parks. Look, I was all for public health measures. I understand you want to cut down on congregating people during an infectious disease thing. I even dealt with the mask nonsense better than a lot of other people did. I understood all those measures, but it got ridiculous when you're roping off playgrounds and things like this. It's just silliness. You told an entire generation of kids that they had to stay home because they couldn't go to school and they had to stay inside because if they go outside, they might catch a deadly illness without a whole lot of tempering with actual facts and being measured. Because when you're dealing with children and young people, they don't need the hyperbole of the moment that we so often do on social media and in politics. They need steady reassurance and straight facts. And we didn't do that for two whole years. Eventually, that was going to catch up with us. Now, this study predates some of that, and it overlaps some of it, so that's not all of it. But in the coming years, as we continue to find out the mental health damage we did to our kids, the academic damage we did where kids are still behind in school, and yes, the fact that they didn't go outside and weren't as active as they were, some of that's on us, and a lot of it's on our government especially our local governments who got real power hungry and absolutely lost their freaking minds by doing things like blocking off outdoor hiking trails and this kind of nonsense. When if you have a communicable infectious disease, outside is probably one of the safest places you could be. We do this to ourselves and then we turn around and wonder why our bad decisions and our bad behavior is reflected on our children. Well, no wonder. Find a mirror. It's usually where a lot of these problems start. More Heard Tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Her Tale. Okay, we talk about overseas stuff a lot. We've been covering the UK, their policies, talking about that prime minister race in the Conservative Party. We don't always look at it from a policy and tax analysis, though, so we're going to turn to our friend over at the Tax Foundation, Sean Briggs, joining us. He's an EU policy analyst there. He focuses on international tax issues, especially with Europe. Sean, great to have you with us. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's start right there. We talk about this stuff. Look, tax policy is one of those things. It gets wonky. There's charts. There's math. I don't like math. There's lots of big words. Why should we pay attention to overseas tax policy when we don't even have a real good grip on American tax policy, just to be honest about it? 
It's a great question. I think the the best way to think about it is tax policies that's passed internationally uh, in other countries, while they apply to the the companies and the citizens and uh, value things that you buy in those countries, um, they also apply outside of those jurisdictions. So, for example, uh, a corporate tax rate in the UK might also apply to US companies that are doing business in the UK. Uh, so that's just one example. But there are many reasons why we should we should really care about what other countries are doing in tax policy. Now, especially true with the UK, this gets complicated in a hurry. But just to give the background, we understand this is a post Brexit issue. We don't know all the issues because they're still sorting them out. They're still trying to figure out things like trade unions and what such. But this is a big deal. It changed how a lot of things were doing with the EU, with the UK. And, you know, it trickles down. It affects how you, U.S. policy goes as well, right? Absolutely. I think one of the main points here is really to focus in on the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, this has been brought up. I'm sure your your listeners and your viewers know very well about Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement generally. But one aspect of it that uh, outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson has talked about recently is reneging a bit on the deal that he came up with with the EU when they left the EU, talking about how Northern Ireland trade would be regulated, talking about uh, what that might mean for a hard border. Uh, and so while that's not necessarily tax policy directly, it certainly impacts uh, trade taxes and the economy in a way that could definitely affect U.S. companies and also the politics of the U.S. Uh, on the other side, I know that when uh, representatives from from Ireland uh, were in the United States previously over the last year, uh, Spe House Speaker Pelosi had mentioned that she was very much still in favor of the Good Friday Agreement, and if the UK did anything to ruin that agreement, it would certainly affect relations between the US and the UK. So that's just something also to keep in mind. Yeah, Sean Burry joining us. Let's before we dig into the UK though, let's talk about Water Europe for just a second because. Taxes to when we hear taxes, America's we we think very certain things. We think our tax refunds. We think about you know withholding. We think about our W twos. These sorts of things. Taxes in Europe are not only different; they're done very differently. You know, like when I, I lived in Germany, I had to do my VAT book because I had vouchers because I was military. Uh, you have VAT taxes. You have a uh, universal health care that has to be paid for. The tax system in Europe is different. So when we say taxes to a European, you've studied this, you've been over there. They're hearing almost a completely different concept in taxes than what we really think of, right? Yeah, I think in Europe, the, the concept of taxes is less about should the government have a role in my life, for example, in healthcare or in transportation policy or in things that Americans might, might not think about so much as being the role of government. Uh, in Europe, those things are, are generally assumed to be the role of government, uh, and therefore they understand that taxes play a role in paying for those things. Uh, so, for example, in, in Scandinavian countries, they have, uh, they have a high tax rate on uh, individuals. Um, for example, in Denmark, I believe it's almost 55 percent, the top income tax bracket. Uh, and that applies to 1.3 times the median av the average salaries in, in that country. So. Uh, equivalently, if you made over $82,000 in the United States, you'd be being taxed at 55% uh, of that income if you if you lived in that country. However, they also understand that those, those tax dollars do go to benefits that they receive on the other end. And so I think Americans generally are a little more skeptical of giving so much money to the government. Uh, and that might also be because they don't necessarily see all the benefits that Europeans do on the other side. Yeah, Sean Bray from the Tax Foundation joining us. Uh, give us a big picture overview, though. Of course, the EU, based mostly out of Brussels, you have Germany, which is the economic engine that drives the EU. The UK stepped out of it. Um, the EU, the UK, America, just kind of stack up their various tax policies against each other. Who do you think is getting it right? Who do you think is struggling a little bit tax policy-wise between those three? So the Tax Foundation actually does a what we call the International Tax Competitive Index every year. And this ranks the competitiveness of all OECD countries' tax systems, um, including obviously the United States, the UK, and Germany. Uh, and the UK actually ranked 22nd on that list um, out of 37 OECD countries. Um, and the problem wasn't necessarily their, their rates, it was more of their tax base. Um, they have a lot of issues in terms of having a broad base, which at the Tax Foundation, we believe in pro-growth uh, tax policy, and that includes broad-based uh, tax tax policies. 
So, so Germany has Germany definitely has uh, a more sound tax system than the UK, for example, when it comes to uh, competitiveness, and that's reflected in their export-oriented economy. Uh, the U.S. after the 2017 uh, TCJA, the Tax Cut and Jobs Reform Act, uh, the that was passed under President Trump, uh, that really moved the United States up on our competitive list. So I think at this point, um, each system has its benefits, each system has its downfalls. Uh, but the UK of the three probably has the most work to do at this particular moment, which is why this election in the UK is so important. Like we talked about before, tax policy, you know, again, it gets wonky, it gets ideological, it gets theorized really quickly. The UK has some really practical built-in reasons why they would have those issues. Number one, this is going to be shocking to some folks, it's an island. So you got to, you know, everything's got it, you know, just basic transportation in and out. It's just a different system than Germany, which is centrally located. Number two is it's not really a big country population-wise, so their tax base is decently small when you compare it to other countries. When you're looking at tax policy, sometimes we just overlook kind of the bare bone stuff like population, like geography, right? I think that's right. Um, there's there's a good argument to be made for uh, eliminating carve outs, specifically for, as you mentioned previously, the value added, value added taxes, which is a consumption tax. Uh, we actually don't have that here in the United States. It would be most similar to a sales tax. Um, but European countries all have, for the most part, a value added tax. And one of the big questions when it comes to value added tax reform is whether they have how many carve outs they have. So for example, in some countries, uh, when you buy groceries, uh, if you're under a certain um, policy, for example, in a high inflation time period, some governments will pass VAT carve outs. And so you won't get taxed on those particular things. I think the closest thing here in the United States would be uh, the going back to school tax holiday uh, where you remove the consumption tax for um, for going back to school goods. Um, so in the UK, that's really where they should focus as well, is understanding that carve-outs and therefore not having as broad of a base can be a big issue. So these carve-outs, though, talking to Sean Bray Tax Foundation, um, these carve-outs, though, obviously, that's not only a powerful policy tool, that's a powerful political tool because you're really putting the government thumb on certain things, not always in a bad way, sometimes in a good way, but that's a lot of political power on top of being an economic indicator also, right? For sure. It is It is certainly uh, government intervention into the free market, if you want to look at it that way. Um, as you mentioned, there are reasons to do it. There are certain products that you can make an argument for. Uh, but oftentimes, governments use it as a political tool, either right before an election or during times of, of high inflation that sometimes are caused by those government policies themselves. Uh, and it's important just to realize that uh, VAT income tax or VAT taxes is one of the most stable revenue sources for our government. So every time that you add another carve out on consumption, uh, the government will have that much less of a stable revenue source to to later draw on for social spending. Yeah, I think it's an important here because I don't know the average taxes as a revenue stream. They just look at it as something they do. They may look at their tax check where they get their refund. Talk about, though, and explain how important that is because the government 100% looks at taxes as a revenue stream. This is something that's so important. Look, this is the very first thing they put in the Constitution after what, a legis what the legislator does, after what Congress does. The very first thing they did and the reason they had to make the constitutional system out of the Articles of Confederation was over how to tax and how to raise revenue for the government. That's what our whole system of government was based off of. Talk about just for a second, because I think this is a real basic concept, but if you're going to talk, talk tax policy, we really need to get a good foundation in what that means, that this is a revenue stream first and foremost, right? Absolutely. I think that's really, when people ask me what I do for my job, they assume that I'm a CPA, which I'm not. Uh, and that's because uh, many people view taxes through, as you had mentioned previously, through an individual lens. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for my paycheck? Uh, how much money am I paying to the government? But people generally don't think about the tax system as a whole. And as you point out correctly, uh, the tax system is a revenue source, and it's all about how the government can raise revenue. Uh, this can be considered sort of a dirty word in the United States sometimes. Uh, people wonder why uh, the United States needs to have revenue. Uh, why should the government need that anyway? Um, but in Europe, it's, it's more understood that the government needs revenue. Uh, 
However, at Tax Foundation, there are better and worse ways to raise revenue. Uh, for example, we see that corporate tax, uh, tax on corporations is one of the least efficient ways to raise revenue for the government because it slows down investment, it slows down economic growth. And so therefore, we, we tend to rely more at the Tax Foundation on policy choices that focus on consumption taxes and other broad-based uh, principal tax policies that can raise stable revenue even through a downturn because that's when the government actually needs the money the most when they're paying out in benefits during downturns. Yeah, Sean Bray joining us. We're going to get into the UK in just a second, but since you just brought it up, it's on everybody's mind, so let's just go there. Uh, words like inflation, words like recession, People don't automatically start thinking tax policy, but tax policy has a tremendous effect on these things because, again, main revenue stream. So when you start talking about fiscal policy, you got to talk about the revenue stream, just like you're balancing your budget at home, although we know the government doesn't do a great job of that. What is the role of tax policy in a debate like this? We just did the Build Back Mansion or whatever you want to call the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which we can debate whether it's going to reduce inflation or not. But this was a piece of it. How are we going to tax corporations? Tax policy in a time like this is really important, isn't it? It is absolutely important. Uh, as someone from the Tax Foundation, I think we think it's always important. But for the general public and the general debate, uh, this was talked about a lot in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, as, as you mentioned, Joe Manchin finally came around to supporting it, as well as Senator Sinema. Uh, and the book tax in the book tech that, that's a part of, of this bill that just signed by the president. Um, we, in our estimation at Tax Foundation, our federal team has gone over the numbers with our modeling tools, and they show that there's minimal to no inflation reduction in the longer term. Uh, we think this is a problem for the economy generally um, because inflation hurts a lot of people in, in a lot of different ways. It's it basically a tax on everybody. Um, so tax policy does play a large role in this, and there are certain taxes that increase inflation and some that decrease inflation. And so it's just a matter of balancing those out in certain times of inflation and also looking at the short to medium windows of of the uh, given policy. Yeah. Sean Bray joining us. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get into the UK. Uh, they got a little bit of a political race going over there. Who the next prime minister is going to be? One of the top issues they're talking about in these debates and hastings, taxes over and over again. Why we should care, why we should pay attention to it. We'll also loop back, talk a little bit more about American tax policy. Sean Bray from Tax Foundation joining us on Hertel. More with him right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Uh, we're talking to our friend Sean Bray from the Tax Foundation. Uh, sharp guy has been overseas. Knows I'm told he speaks French and Deutsch, but we're not going to test that because I've had a head injury since then, and my sprechenzy isn't what it used to be, my friend. Um, but let's go back overseas, the UK. Uh, we've been talking about this with our UK contributors. Outside of the cost of living crisis, they're talking about taxes more than I can ever remember uh, politics in the UK talking about taxes. It's really kind of phenomenal to watch, especially for the conservative party. Why should an American audience pay attention to something like the UK's tax policy? We talked about it with the EU a little bit, but just break it down for us. Why is it important that one of the leaders of one of our closest allies paying attention to what their tax policies are? Yeah, I think one reason that Americans should really care about what's going on in the UK at the moment in terms of tax policy uh, is that London specifically, but the UK more broadly, was always seen and, and used by American companies abroad as the gateway to the EU. Uh, now that the UK has left the EU, uh, some rearrangement has taken place. Some companies have moved from, uh, from London to Dublin or to the continent of Europe, uh, but it's still, it's still a hub for American businesses operating over in Europe. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. For example, uh, certain tax policies, the language, cultural similarities between American business and, and the UK. Uh, so there, there's a lot of reasons why uh, American companies choose the UK to do business uh, with their overseas partners in Europe. However, uh, one, of the main, uh, one of the main discussions right now in this, in this election race 
is talking about whether to change the corporate tax rate in the UK. And it's currently at 19%. And uh, Rishi Sunak is proposing to up that to 25% by April 2023. Uh, Liz Truss, on the other hand, has said that she will not do that. Um, and so it's really a question of how competitive the UK business climate is going to be going forward, um, which obviously directly impacts US companies. Um, and their investment decisions and where they locate in Europe. Uh, so there's definitely an economic impact on not only the UK, but the United States based on what their tax policies are. Yeah, and a good recent headline example for the average person that doesn't keep up with economics, when the Russian sanctions of the oligarchs started, almost all of them went through London because that's where almost all of them do their banking internationally. So London and, and the e UK has always kind of been that central hub, although some of it's moved to Frankfurt and other places. Um, let's talk about the corporate tax rate though. Compare it for a second. So folks know, because I, I'm, you know, some like 60% of Americans can't name the three branches of government. I'm pretty sure most Americans probably don't know what the corporate tax rate is. So just compare it. The E, the UK tax rate to the American tax rate. What are we talking about? What's the similarities and what are the differences? Yeah. So I think a good place to start actually is, uh, referring back to our, our index, um, Actually, in the OECD average is around 23% uh, this past year. So the UK going from 19 to 25% under Richie Sunak would actually be increasing the, the corporate tax rate above even the OECD average. Uh, currently, the United States is around 21%. Uh, President Biden has talked about changing that recently, uh, but for now it's at 21%. Uh, so that would certainly put the UK at a disadvantage relative to the rest of the United States and the OECD uh, more broadly when it comes to tax competition. Yeah. Um, when you hear somebody like Rishi Sunak, he was a, he was the head of the Exeter, which is you know kind of like our Treasury, although a much more powerful role. Um, he's a smart guy, Stanford educated. He knows these numbers backwards and forwards. How much of this is political and how much of this is good policy? Because they keep talking about taxes. So the appetite is there. They have the cost of living. Is the policies they're putting out matching what the country needs that's having a cost of living crisis, though? Um, without being too political on my side, of course, uh, we try at the tax nation just to take the numbers as they are. Um, I think that it's there are merits to both sides. However, um, in a time like this, for example, Liz Truss's plan is to to keep the rates where they are, to lower tax rates, um, and lowering tax rates in a time of inflation is actually can have negative effects. Um, however. On the other side, for, for Mr. Sunak, if you're going to raise taxes, uh, especially on corporations, that can dampen growth and dampen investment in the UK uh, from in the short to medium term. And so once inflation hopefully goes away sooner rather than later, uh, you might end up with a UK that's uncompetitive and can't draw as much investment decisions in the UK as it once would have would have done. So I think on both sides, uh, of course, these decisions are, are political, but even from an economics perspective, uh, they both have their, their benefits and negatives. Yeah, Sean Bray joining us. Let's zoom back out to the EU. You've wrote about this before, the corporate income tax rates in Europe more broadly. Uh, no real surprises here. Germany's number two. France is number three. These are traditional powers, traditional large economies. They're allies of us, obviously. As this new EU post Brexit emerges, and especially with events like with what Russia and what's going on in UK in the <laughs> UK, especially with Russia and what's going on in the Ukraine, does the EU itself need to review its tax policy structures, both corporately and and as a unit? Because obviously the world is kind of changing around them a little bit. Where are they at on tax policy as a combined EU? That's a great question. So I think the first thing that's important to know uh, for your listeners and your viewers is that uh, the EU actually doesn't have taxing power per se. It's a member state competence. So in the United States, uh, for example, the equivalent would be if only the state governments could raise taxes, but the federal government could not. That's generally what's happening in the, in the EU broadly. Uh, however, um, that has been called into question recently, as you mentioned, because of the war and because of other uh, surrounding kind of geopolitical effects that are that are around the EU. So there is a push within the EU and the European Commission, especially uh, in the European Parliament, to look at what they call own resources. So own resources is a, is a way for the, the EU to gain money for itself into the EU budget. And so instead of 
uh, relying on member states and their governments, uh, for example, the French government or the German government, the EU is contemplating policies to raise its own money for the EU's purposes themselves. They already have a certain amount of what they call own resources that mostly comes from governments directly to the EU, uh, but they are looking to expand their own resources uh, to, to combat some of these other issues in the world. Uh, so that's an ongoing debate in the EU that has a lot of different consequences economically and politically. Yeah, it's funny you said the member states, because again, that's that almost sounds like the Article Confederation, which is what brought us our current system. That was the problem. They couldn't raise enough revenue for the federal government. They didn't have power to enforce it, among other issues, but that was kind of the big one. Let's bring this back to the U.S. for a minute, though. Um, we don't, how are we talking about taxes and tax policy in America right now in the discourse? We don't really talk about it as much. I don't think we talk about it as much as we used to. Like, we don't even have politicians just say, let's lower taxes is just a buzzword like we used to. There just doesn't seem to be the same discussion that there used to be maybe in a previous generation of politics. Is that a good or a bad sign that they we don't seem to really talk about tax policy unless it's a specific piece of legislation or something like that? Am I imagining that or is that a trend? It might be a trend. I'm not. A, I don't have a personal opinion per se on that. I haven't studied it too much, but I think in general, um, our politics is is divided, obviously, in in all kinds of social ways and, and political ways. Um, I don't think taxes uh, is necessarily a a uh, an attention drawing topic for for some people in in our times. Uh, the debate tends to be focused on the spending side of things, and of course. Taxes, nobody wants to talk about those because it's much easier to sell politically a spending program rather than a, a tax increase to pay for those spending programs. So I think when it comes to politicians and the way we, in our discourse, we talk about taxes, uh, it's it's not always the most popular thing to have to explain that we're going to be taking more of your money if, if in a tax increase or uh, it can also be very complex and very in the weeds. And I think for most people, uh, it's it's not very interesting. So especially in a political world where uh, headlines grab the attention of most people, uh, tax policy generally doesn't make it onto the front pages. Sean Bray joining us. All right. The downside of that, of course, is um, I'm not great at math, but I do understand our fiscal house as a nation is not in particularly good shape right now. Unless we cut spending, rein in government and or something really strange happens, at some point, taxes are going to have to go up just to balance the sheets in here. Is How do we have that conversation with the average American citizen? Do you think, again, taxes and tax policy, that's one of those wonky things that you just said it. People don't really want to talk about it because it's they don't like it, number one. And number two, it's very, we have a ridiculously complex system. How do we start having that conversation, though? Because there's also this reality bomb coming down the road that at some point the tax system that we have is insufficient to the government we have. That's just kind of a basic math problem, right? Yeah, I think one way that we at Tax Foundation like to talk about taxes is in a pro growth manner. And so our we have principal tax policy ideas that we, that we advocate for, that we try to educate policymakers on. And all of our policy ideas really point in the direction of pro-growth, uh, economic opportunity. And so I think that's a way of talking to the average person about tax policy is when you have tax a tax system that not only generates the right around, amount of revenue for the government based on its spending bills and its spending programs, uh, but also a way that encourages innovation, encourages investment, stimulates, stimulates job creation. Um, I think that's something that most Americans can can easily relate to, and I think in general think it's a good idea. Um, I don't know of many people who would say I want a tax regime that discourages businesses from creating jobs that I might be able to apply for in the future. So I think talking about it in ways that that really relate to the average person uh, and what it means for their family, what it means for buying food, putting it on the table. I think that's where where policymakers should really start talking about taxes uh, in an, in a layman's way. Yeah. And in that vein, Sean Bray joining us, um, how detrimental to the conversation is it when we buzzwords things like 
oh, corporations pay their fair share. Well, of course, everybody wants that, but that doesn't actually mean anything when you go to write a policy. It's just kind of a buzzword. Um, tax the rich. Um, deadbeats that aren't p- pulling their own weight when it comes to individuals. When you're talking about policies, though, the way we've become a buzzwordy social media debate society, that's not really helping anything, is it? Not really. Uh, for example, actually, in the EU, they have what's called the the fair taxation kind of approach. As as we speak, um, this has come into the debates about uh, proposals on wealth taxes. Uh, talking about corporate taxes, uh, increasing them specifically on American companies, not only uh, in the just general sense, but also in the digital space, uh, talking about the tech companies that operate in Europe that are American. And so this is a this is an ongoing uh, conversation and not only in the United States, but also in Europe. And I think it's important to understand that um, many, many journalists write articles talking about, for example, how much money Amazon paid in taxes last year. Um, and a lot of times that's, that misrepresents the actual way that taxes are, are paid. Um, that's a lot of the times you have to consider, for example, in our tax code, we have incentives to invest and to buy machinery and to build factories. Uh, and we give tax credits for those things to businesses. So usually journalists tend not to focus on those and they rather focus on the, the top rate, which can be lowered based on incentives that our tax code gives companies to invest rather than pay taxes directly to the government. So I think it's it's important to ha- always have a context when you're talking about tax policy and rates and effective rates, um, especially when we talk about corporations and their fair share or, or wealthy individuals and things like that. It's not to say that people shouldn't pay their fair share and they shouldn't do what the law requires them to do, but I think it's important just to understand that there are ways of reducing your tax bill overall uh, that that are productive for the economy and that are encouraged by our tax code legally. Yeah, let's round this up with a little practical application. There's People are scared because the economy is a little uncertain right now. Um, it may not be as bad as some people think. It's bad for some people, but not others, which is part of the problem. And while we have weird economic numbers like, you know, <laughs> labor shortages and low unemployment at the same time, you know, people are confused and that makes them a little scared sometimes. What's a practical way, something they should be watching for either in the media or in government reporting when it comes to their taxes that they should be actually watching out for? Turn the noise down for us a little bit. What's something in a government policy? Maybe it's something in the Inflation Reduction Act. Maybe it's something that's policy-wise coming up. It is an election year, so people are talking about lots of policies. What's something people should be really paying attention to and watching for for their own sakes going forward here in the next near future? I think one of the most important things that that the average person can watch for that doesn't necessarily apply to them directly in in terms of income taxes. But something that's been talked about a lot uh, is how we treat um, investment decisions and how we tax those those, uh, decisions. One policy that I think everyone should be watching out for, especially in an election year, is how they will treat full expensing in the tax code. And full expensing is really a a good tax policy for pro-growth. It's principled. It allows businesses to recoup a lot of the the tax money on their investments that stimulate jobs, that stimulate economic activity, and generally do do much better for the economy. So I think that's something uh, that's been tossed around a lot in in these discussions with Build Back Better and now the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, The president and and Republicans have been going back and forth about how to treat full expensing and the tax code going forward. And so I think that's really important because full expensing is a good way to to stimulate growth, stimulate the economy, create jobs, um, and is very efficient in that sense. Yeah, Sean Bray, Tax Foundation. Great stuff today. Appreciate your time. Let folks know where they can follow you and what you got going on until we see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm not on social media, but I but on our Tax Foundation website, we have an EU landing page, which actually uh, includes all of our EU material. Uh, that's where you'll find most of my publications. And uh, I look forward to coming back uh, whenever you'll have me. Yep, we threw a lot of hard questions at it, and you answered them so well that even I understood most of it. There's a couple of things in there I'm going to have to go Google. I'm not going to lie, some of the policy stuff. But we will link to all of this in the show notes, including his writing. Make sure you read it all in full. Uh, Sean Bray, Tax Foundation, thank you so much for the time, sir. I appreciate it.
Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. in on an uplifting note or a good note this is a fun one uh quiet street in fort green this is in new york city cbs news stands in sharp contrast to what's happening inside a former church where young ukrainians cast is rehearsing for an upcoming performance of mom on skype at brooklyn's irondale theater eight children ages 7 to 14 a director mom and other parents chaperones have been invited to the united states from their war-torn homeland for a unique presentation of their original play. These Ukrainian children, how brave they are. How did you decide on this? CBS 2's Dana Tyler asked Harry Grease, the executive director of the Irondale Theater. Quote, what they do in the middle of war when bombs are falling around them, potentially they decided to make a play, and that's incredible. I thought we got to get them here. That's what Grease helped to do after reading about the show. After months of red tape, visa applications, political wrangling, and threatening, he saw what he calls an impossible project, finally realized. Every one of them came over. They hugged me. They thanked me for bringing them here, he said. They were so, what can you say, genuine. The play was in production for months before the war started in Ukraine. It was performed in April only once in a warehouse turned bomb shelter and leave. Mom on Skype is based on the stories about children missing their parents who are forced to work away from their families. Quote, they understand us and how our kids and children live without parents, without moms. All a kid need is love from a parent. It's a 12-year-old Mara <laughs> Kuzma's her last name. I'm not going to try the first one. Sorry. Uh, the production was a labor of love for director Oleg Onashchik, but as a soldier, he was not allowed to leave the country. His wife, Maria, mother of actors Hanna and Oleski, stepped in to direct the state side while Ukrainian memories are ever present. Quote, when you're in a bomb shelter rehearsing, what on that earth was that like? And in Ukrainian, she explained that they lived in Kiev, in Ukraine, where the refugees would come, where many people lost their homes. We have all air alarms several times a day, they said. We are in the place where people would come to save their lives. When we went to America, it's like another life because it's without any alarms or without any dangers, without any planes, without the Russian planes. Beyond rehearsals, there's some much appreciated downtime. The kids were hosted at a camp in Connecticut, and they stayed in touch with new friends. They also enjoyed a most anticipated trip to the Statue of Liberty. Liberty has become an even more critical component in the play. They say their goal is to raise money to buy a fighter jet. There's something we don't cover that kids are trying to raise money for very often, but close the skies because we want to live. We want to live in our house with our parents, with our beds in our Ukraine, said 13-year-old Valery Kozimpa. When they had a premiere in a shelter, they decided they could, with their acting, with their play, try to raise some money for our armed forces and all the wild themes of missing parents under the specter of today's times are never more poignant. It hurts, yeah, the children can't touch their parents. They can't hug, said Christina Hineko. The show ends with an original song, A Plea for Peace, written and sung mostly in English by 12-year-old Hannah. For this message, even Oneska found words in English. Please, this war, this genocide must stop because we want to live. We love life, and our country is very beautiful. Uh, there's more about this show, Moms on Skype. We're going to link to it in the show notes. That's pretty unique, pretty brave stuff. Good point to pause and realize that what we complain about day to day maybe ain't as important as we think it is compared to what some people in other parts of the world are doing. That's our good faith segment. Makes folks feel good. And that'll do it for this Monday on Herd Tell. Glad you're back with us. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, Got questions, comments, feedback, like the show, didn't like the show. Maintain your bearing, but we'd love to hear from you at Herd Tell Show on gmail.com, at Herd Tell Show on the Twitter. Of course, my Twitter handle and our guest social media is always on the screen on the YouTube page. By the way, the return of the Herd Tell podcast, Deep Dives, had one over this weekend. Big response to it. Make sure you do not miss it. Our friend Chris Schlock was at CPAC Dallas Live. Victor Orban, Donald Trump, that's Straka. 
MTG thing with the cage. Did you know that was actually part of an overall scheme to attack a sitting representative to his face who was at CPAC? Lots of little tidbits you need to know, especially like the demographic change and the cost, things like that. Uh, make sure you're finding that wherever you're listening or watching her tell that, whether it's on the podcasting platforms or on the YouTube channel. But of course, you can always watch, listen to us every weekday right here, wherever you're getting this from. Make sure you're following us. Make sure you subscribe. Do us a favor. Share us. Let other people know about our little program. So until we talk to you again, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And we hope to talk to you again real soon on her tell. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24 7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.